Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, you know, I always wondered about teachers when they come up to the front of the room and nobody's sitting in the front rows. Why is that? I, you know. <laughs> um, but welcome, everybody, and I'm very delighted to be here. So I can get a sense of the audience. I would very much appreciate for anybody who's a member of the general public um, to raise their hand in the sense that they're not a provider, they're not in hospital administration. Who's here from the general public? Thank you. And how about people who are hospital administrators? Plan administrators, okay. Plan administrators. Um, and then how about practicing physicians? Okay, who are the rest of you? <laughs> who did I miss? Um, social workers? Huh? Oh, okay, other kind, well, you're provide. okay, you're a practicing provider, um, okay. I did, I say physician, I apologize. So any other practicing providers? Okay, great, good. Okay, thank you. So um, as Kim said, today we're gonna talk about alternative payment models. And to reemphasize what she said, I really do want this to be an informal session. Please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. We have mics in the front, so we ask you to use the mic when you ask a question so it feeds into the video system. Um, and so that the people who uh, watch this uh, subsequently will be able to um, hear the question. And um, there's a lot of information here. I will try to um, go through it in a way that makes sense to you, um, but if it doesn't, ask a question, or if you have a comment, make it, please. So just very briefly about the organization I'm with, Baylet Health. Uh, we're a small consulting firm, and we're really dedicated work to working with public agencies um, like the Oregon Health um, Agency and um, uh, uh, CCO, CCOs uh, and private purchasers um, to improve health care. So um, that's our mission. We feel that even though we are a consulting firm, we're very much of a mission-driven consulting firm. And we have um, assisted the OHA with designing the quality-based payment strategy for the CCOs. And we continue to advise um, OHA on a range of issues. And today, uh, we were asked by IHN CCO leadership to give you some background information about what's happening nationally around payment reform and then what's happening also um, at IHN CCO. So, what I'm going to do is, um, first of all, make a case for business re uh, payment reform. Why are we even talking about this? Um, in that regard, also talking about why fee-for-service isn't working, what the alternatives to fee-for-service are, what payment models are currently being piloted by IHN CCO, and whether they're on the right track, and then look at some recommendations for um, the CCO to consider, um, and then provide opportunities for discussion. I've got to emphasize that I am not here to tell you what to do. What you have to do comes out of your own culture and discussions, and it's not something that can be um, proposed or even recommended or even imposed from someone from the outside. However, I think it is helpful to understand what's going on nationally, because there are some very clear trends going on, and there are reasons that those trends are occurring. And you can learn from what's happening elsewhere as you bring those um, changes to your environment. So um, when you think about fee-for-service, what is it? You get paid for doing something. It's piecework, right? It's the old-fashioned piecework. You um, sold a shirt and you got paid for it. Well, in this case, you're providing medical care and you get paid for it. It is volume driven. And as a result, you get lots of volume. Uh, visits, tests, procedures, duplication of services. And it ends up being a very expensive healthcare system. And um, if you look at um, benefits of healthcare in terms of longevity, life's longevity, you can see that the U.S. is way out in terms of cost, way out where the um, arrow is as you're facing that the far right. Um, and it's also off the curve, which is um, the line that's drawn between the other 
uh, countries and what they are achieving in terms of longevity with their kind of health care. So this tells us two things. It tells that the, us, the United States healthcare system is very expensive and you're not and we're not getting the longevity in life that you would expect from that kind of money. Okay? Um, if you look at us in another way uh, compared to other industrialized countries, there's uh, rankings here around quality of care, access, efficiency, equality, and healthy lives. And at the very far uh, right, right side of the chart is the US ranking. We're not in the top one or two uh, in anything. So we're not getting a bang for our buck. The fee-for-service incentive system doesn't provide any incentives to coordinate care. Each provider is providing their own set of services. There's very little coordination. There's duplication of services. And this, uh, the physicians look at their little, not little, but their world, and not necessarily think about the other kinds of worlds that are feeding into um, what's happening with the patient. Um, they uh, do not have incentives to avoid duplication of services, and there is no way to pay for value-added services that are traditionally not reimbursed. Care management services, outreach worker services, um, educational services, all that help the patient stay healthy or get healthy are not generally reimbursed under our fee-for-service system, right? And so you've got a system that pays for things to happen, but not for systems of care. And so uh, as a result, we have siloed and uncoordinated uh, services, and there is um, a very strong bias towards specialty services because it's higher reimbursement. More, it's more complex activities going on. They get paid more under a piecemeal kind of system. Um, are there benefits to a fee-for-service system? Absolutely. It does motivate providers to provide patients with access to services and to provide needed and unneeded services. So providers are incented to provide services. Um, and it does have an impact on technology and innovation. And so that there are incentives for new services and medications um, to be developed under our fee-for-service system. Now, um, there is, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of him, uh, on, uh, an observer of the healthcare system, Atul Gawande, who is himself a surgeon. And he's also a policy analyst, a healthcare policy analyst. He has just written a new article in the New Yorker called Overkill. And he makes the argument that not only is there too much service being provided in our healthcare system, but that it's that the unnecessary services are crowding out necessary services. And he provides a whole range of examples in his article. Um, and so some people uh, raise the question, well, if we have new kinds of systems that are new kinds of payment uh, that encourage less provision of health care, are we going to cheat people out of needed health care? And his argument and the argument of almost any policy analyst that's looking at this is that there is so much, too much health care that it's going to take a long time before that happens. There are estimates that up to one third of all the health care costs in the United States are either unnecessary or um, harmful. So there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, one of the areas that he discusses in his article is McLean, uh, Texas, which is right on the border. And he went there about five years ago and did a study of what's going on there because it was one of the most expensive places in the United States to receive health care services. They spent more on uh, health care services in that small community than in many other communities. And he went back this time after there had been some health care reform and the costs of the care have dropped dramatically and the measures of better health care, lower blood sugar for diabetics, reduced obesity, um, reduced uh, time in the ER, 
reduced number of inpatient stays had all improved. So that's just sort of a little microcosm of what's possible. So uh, when we talk about payment reform, what are we talking about? We're talking about moving away from fee-for-service and towards other ways of paying that provide financial incentive, incentives to providers to provide high quality, efficient care. Not low cost, but efficient care, okay? That's really, really important to understand. And also, the purpose of payment reform is not payment reform in and of itself. It is to provide payment and incentives for a better delivery system model. Payment reform is critical. You can't have delivery system reform without payment reform. But payment reform by itself isn't going to get you what you want. OK? Um, we like to argue that uh, payment reform is such a powerful incentive that it's really the first domino. It has a dramatic impact on provider behavior, um, and it is a significant influence. And so it's one of the key things that you've got to think about. And then think about it in terms of structuring your payment to get the delivery system reform that you want. OK, questions before we go any further? So the okay, business case on why we want to move to fee-for-service. I've, I've heard that um, fee-for-service by itself is not the, the main problem. It's a matter of how you build incentives, whether it's fee-for-service or not. So maybe in your talk you can say it's not necessarily an evil. Sure. Um, so let me go back to some earlier things I said. Um, the problem right now is we have very few other in incentives than fee-for-service. And fee-for-service is the predominant incentive system which is volume based. And when we, you were a perfect segue because some of the alternatives to fee-for-service actually build on the fee-for-service. Don't throw it out, but build on it, okay? So we're gonna talk about supplemental payments to a fee-for-service system, pay for perform performance, which can be an add-on to fee-for-service or an add-on to other kinds of payments. We're going to talk about episode-based payments, which are also sometimes called bundled payments. And then finally, population-based payments. And we'll uh, define those as we move forward. So um, supplemental payments. We're usually talking about a set amount of dollars being paid per member per month. So if you have 100 people in your group and you pay $2 per member, so every month you pay $200 to this provider group. Um, per member per month for uh, as a supplemental payment. And uh, as I said, it's a predetermined amount. It's for each qualified patient. And they're usually very um, targeted, the purposes. Um, they oftentimes are used in patient-centered medical home models to pay providers to build infrastructure that they don't have, to provide care management services that they don't get reimbursed for. So those are two examples uh, of how um, supplemental payments are used. And supplemental payments can vary based on patient characteristics. So for instance, if you have a care management uh, fee for uh, supplemental payment, you may pay a certain amount for most patients and then more for um, children with special health care needs uh, because of the increased need for care management services for that particular population group. Um, as I said, oftentimes they're used to uh, support practice infrastructure. Uh, so for those who are familiar with the patient-centered medical home model, you would build patient registries where you have lists of all patients that have um, diabetes and can keep track of the kinds of services uh, they're receiving and their key clinical um, uh, data, uh, building uh, data analytic capabilities, practice coaching uh, kinds of activities as well. Um, they can also um, provide 
uh, resources to support non-traditional services like the care management and the care coordination and the e-visits, the e-health activities uh, as well. And the um, Care Oregon's payment model for PCMHs is, is an example of the supplemental payment. In that model, uh, there are payments available at three levels uh, to clinics based on what level they attain, anywhere from $2 for level one to $6 for level three. And they uh, all start at level one and move to um, a higher level based on data submission and performance improvement. So level two has to show at least a 3% improvement on at least one measure, and a level three has to show at least a 3% improvement on at least three measures. So that's one example. Um, it, the um, other example from Oregon is that um, there's a home health uh, program that has enhanced payments, and this is a program that really focuses on Medicaid beneficiaries with uh, that are very um, seriously ill and costly. They oftentimes have um, both uh, physical and serious and persistent mental health conditions. And so these payments are designed to support comprehensive care, including these traditionally non-reimbursed services, uh, particularly around care coordination and behavioral health integration services. Um, and CMS pays the state and exists an additional amount of money and um, uh, PCPCH clinics uh, could receive between 10 and 24 uh, dollars per member per month based on their tier of recognition. So these are for very seriously um, compromised individuals. And this just shows you in terms of the dollar amounts how they can vary um, based on the type of the program and the purpose of the program and the type of uh, services to be covered. So the pros of, of supplemental payments, uh, it is a very straightforward way of providing incentives uh, for um, building infrastructure and providing services that would not otherwise be funded. And it is especially important for small and independent practices that aren't big enough to participate in some of the other kinds of payment models that we're going to be talking about that involve some risk. Um, the cons are that um, unless uh, amount of money that's being paid, uh, unless it is substantive, you don't get much of a behavior change on the part of the providers. And if it's not tied to performance, there's really no accountability. So if you get um, dollars for care management, but there's no tracking as to whether you actually provide the care management, um, then uh, you know how does the plan know if there's any kind of benefit? And very seldom are supplemental payments tied to cost. It's usually um, tied to some kind of infrastructure or um, other kind of activity. Um, and so our experience is that um, supplemental payments to be effective have to be tied to very specific measurable uh, performance requirements um, and that there must be sub uh, sufficient dollars tied to them to um, really make it worthwhile to go through the pain of changing processes and um, really starting around the transformation uh, road. Um, moreover, practices, because transformation is not easy, um, need to be supported and their activities monitored. Any questions on supplemental payments? How, how do you handle grade inflation, diagnosis inflation, uh, without creating a police state <laughs> kind of feeling? When we get to um, some of the later activities around population management and using capitations, there's not a lot of incentive to do that. The incentives are to provide better care for the individuals. So. I think you bring out a very, very important point. Back in the 80s, um, when the first HMO movement started, um, it really was a top-down kind of activity. What's happening with payment reform this time around 
is there is a real incentive and a real movement to get the incentives in place for the providers to do the right thing because of the incentives and not because of the police state. It, there's a balance. So um, having performance targets that everybody agrees to are appropriate. Um, gives assurances that the right kinds of services are being provided and the, right, and the incentives are working the way intended without Big Brother looking over the provider's shoulders. And, and that is a very, very important point. So thank you for bringing that out. You know, sometimes we work in the field so long we just make that assumption, um, but it is critical. Now, second, now we're moving to pay for performance. It's similar in the sense that um, it's dollars added on to a fee-for-service system. Um, it's usually structured as a financial bonus and there are pre-established targets of excellence or improvements. So for instance, let's say you have a goal of having 70% um, oh, of your diabetics have you, their blood sugar under their control. So you could get a um, pay for performance uh, quality bonus either if you met that benchmark or you increased the number of diabetics who were uh, under control by a specified percentage. So, so you would move towards getting to that benchmark. So let's say you were at 50%. So you could get, a, I'm making these numbers up, so you could get paid a performance bo bonus by moving up 5% over a year. Um, or if you're already at 80, you would get, or 70, you would already get, you would get your pay per performance bonus at that time. Um, it can include financial disincentives, withholds, or reduced payments for per poor performance. And as I said, this is added on to fee-for-service, so you're not throwing out the fee-for-service. You're adding a, a specifically structured incentive system on top. Um, pros, it starts to more effectively counter um, the exclusive emphasis on fee-for-service, and it will provide quality-based incentives. Like the um, supplemental payments, the rewards need to be large enough to get attention. Um, most programs focus on quality, very little on cost. Um, and it is, it's hard to measure whether it's having an impact when the volume, when the patient volume is low, because you don't have any statistical significance, okay? Um, so just to give you an example, and I'll run through this quickly, this is from Massachusetts. They developed an extensive hospital-based P4P. Uh, P4P stands for pay for performance. And so this also is included to show you that pay for performance can go to different kinds of providers. It doesn't just have to be um, uh, 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 primary care physicians. It can be hospitals. And there's a whole series of quali quality measures around um, infection rates and how quickly you provide certain medications in the emergency room and that kind of thing. So that there, there's a rich set of uh, quality performance measurements to develop a pay for performance program. And so you can see that first year they measured uh, pneumonia care and surgical in, uh, infection prevention. Um, and uh, they expanded it to heart attacks, and they have a fair amount of money, $50 million up there. And then they um, introduced in 2012 incentives around potentially preventable admissions. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're well uh, aware of it, but particularly in the elderly population, um, the opportunity or the likelihood of coming back for readmissions within 30 days of discharge um, is fairly high. And those that do come back have a, a poorer outcome than those that don't. And so that there's a real emphasis uh, from the federal government down through the state government to um, prevent uh, potentially avoidable readmissions. And so here you can see a whole series of um, measures that they're working on around the hospital pay for performance. Um, and there have been many studies on how effective pay for performance is because they really thought, um, I don't know, five or so years ago that this was going to be the answer. But in fact, there are mixed results. And it has shown modest improvements 
in specific outcomes, um, uh, improvement outcomes, and increased efficiency. Um, but uh, it's not always able to measure it over time. And oftentimes, the incentives are just too um, small. And um, the focus on limited benchmarks is um, too limited. So as a result, um, they're not uh, very consistent findings on cost savings of P for P, and um, there it isn't the total uh, solution that it would hope to be. More recently has been the new focus on episode-based payments. What does that mean? Um, it's a fixed dollar amount that covers a set of services for a defined period of time. So. It could be for a joint replacement. And it would cover the hospital, it would cover the physician, and it would cover post-acute care uh, for a certain period of time. And all those costs would be bundled together and paid to those providers to provide the, that service for the joint replacement. And the way it's structured is that um, you can have shared savings or shared risk. So if the providers are very effective at providing care with little complications, they can share the savings with the health plan that's pay paying the, um, the payment in that matter. And there are certain kinds of procedures that are very, very effectively paid in this. And it's effective because you talk to any kind of specialist that's involved in the pay for performance um, method now, and they will tell you that before they got involved in the pay for performance, they had no idea what was happening to that patient after that patient left the hospital. And so you take joint replacements. Um, oftentimes, the people will go to rehab center. The rehab center may be effective, may not. Um, next thing, the doctor knows is the patient may be back in his or her office complaining of joint pain. Um, when you have a bundled payment, um, those that are particularly effective have a goal of zero patients going into a rehab uh, facility that instead they receive the appropriate pre-surgery um, uh, training and education and exercises. They get uh, excellent care in the hospital and they go home and they get home-based and outpatient-based physical therapy. And as a result, um, the ones that are really running well have very fewer complications, they have much more satisfied, satisfied patients, and they are providing these services at substantially less cost. So that's just an example of how the episode-based payments can work. Um, they, as I said, they have a shared savings, um, and sometimes there's a shared loss or shared risk uh, component. Now, to assure that people are getting the good care, there is uh, typically a quality component, component. Either you have to meet the quality components in order to get the shared savings, or they add on a quality component. Um, so, as I said, there are certain types of activities that work best for um, episode-based payments. They're procedures with wide variation um, and uh, in, in costs that are unrelated to price. And, and so they suggest an opportunity for savings, like the joint replacement and the use of, uh, heavy use of um, uh, rehab services that are inpatient or, or acute rehab services. You have to have sufficient volume. So any kind of uh, uh, unique or unusual kind of event would not work well. You have to have analytics uh, in real time, as close to real time as possible, so that the providers can follow what's happening with the patient over time. And there has to be strong leadership at the state, the plan, and the practice level to make this work. So. Um, it has demonstrated that um, these episode-based payments 
can provide very substantive change in healthcare delivery. Um, they reward efficiency. They provide motivated uh, providers with the opportunity to reduce variation in costs and to do well. The cons are that it can be very administratively complex to administer. Um, and if it's not structured right, uh, you can have uh, prices that are outside the um, episode that's covered by the single cost go up. Um, and and the, you have to negotiate a lot of information going into an episode. For instance, the size of the episode, what's included, what's excluded. That can, um, frankly, undermine the risk savings potential. Any questions on this sort of general concept before I go into an example? Question in the back. Um, isn't another con of this that there's the potential for providers to want to cherry pick patients? That goes into, uh, that's a very good question. Um, that goes into how you define your, um, your, uh, uh, your, your uh, definition of your, of your bundle. Um, so you can define it very narrowly so you exclude a lot of complications or patients with um, you know, multiple co comorbidities. And in that way, you can start you know, narrowing it so much that it is going to have a positive impact. Those that work in this area a lot say that the only way they really uh, are effective and do what they're intended is if you keep the definition wide, you can't cherry pick, and it really forces the providers to work together to provide effective care. And you have to fairly price it. Very important to fairly price it, otherwise um, you know, you've got a problem with cherry picking and uh, undermining the, the efforts for payment reform. I'm wondering with the episode-based payments, what happens to flexibility and treatment? And I'm thinking about what the patient-centered primary care home model and the partnership between the patient and the provider. Is there flexibility in the type of treatment they have, or is there like a set protocol for treatment that the provider will only get paid if they do things in a certain way? Um, the, the, okay, uh, there are uh, chronic uh, episodes and there are acute episodes. Uh, acute episodes are usually surgical kinds of activities or, um, and so those are gonna be your specialists and so your PCP is gonna refer to a specialist that he or she is comfortable uh, with referring to. Uh, and there, uh, arguably, uh, because of the way the bundles are, are built, there should be incentives for the specialist to coordinate with the PCP so that there is good after um, care uh, that involves both PCP and specialists for the, for the acute episodes. When you're talking about chronic episodes, the ones that are being developed are ones that would involve the PCP. So it would be like treating asthma um, or treating diabetics. And that's usually for a certain period of time. And then the physician will get a certain amount of payment for taking care of their, uh, his or her diabetic or asthmatic patients. And there would be in, um, uh, technical assistance to provide the best um, practices to the patient population. Um, I have not seen in the... Um, chronic episodes, the um, effort to uh, have standardization so firm that there is no flexibility. I have absolutely seen it in the uh, episodic uh, care uh, episodes developed by the providers and implemented by the providers. This is how they think care should be de developed, particularly in the orthopedic area. Because they are like, you know, carpenters. They continue to do the same thing over and over again and improving it each time they do it and perfecting it. Um, but I don't, I have not seen that in the more um, chronic episodes. And the chronic episodes are just starting to be developed. They're, they're still in the you know, early development stage. Another question? In the more chronic models, are you seeing any uh, examples where 
uh, behavioral health or dental may be added into that episode. So um, someone with comorbid conditions across outside of the med traditional medical system. What I've seen, um, there was a very interesting uh, project in Missouri where um, there was that effort through the Health Home uh, Grant uh, or program through CMS to um, bring, uh, to make the um, community mental health centers responsible for the physical health of their patients and for uh, the uh, health homes in the primary care world to be responsible for the behavioral health uh, needs of their clients. And they had very specific programs where they had to have, the PCPs had to affiliate with a, um, a behavioral health provider uh, that provided certain kinds of services on site, et cetera, or through a contracted arrangement. And for the community mental health uh, center, they had to have a uh, physical health trained nurse on site to oversee those. So I've seen that kind of thing uh, being developed. Uh, there's a lot of talk about it. Um, New York is uh, going to be doing a bundle payment program, and they're talking about um, integrated behavioral health, but that's very new. I have not seen anything with dental. And yet we know dental has such an impact, particularly on cardiac um, activities. Okay, so um, Arkansas is the leader in bundled payments uh, through their Medicaid program and two commercial insurers. They launched this program in 2012. Um, they had five initial episodes. I think they're up to like 48 now, or they will be up to 48 very uh, soon. They're just um, really going gung-ho on this. Now, they have identified their bundles very narrowly, and they say, and these, these are mandatory for Medicaid, this is not voluntary, and they say if you have seven cases a year, then you have to participate. So, I mean, that's how, um, uh, you know, deep into their payment model that they're impl implementing this. They are implementing the bundles in conjunction with a patient-centered medical home model. So it's not um, inconsistent, but it's being uh, in implemented together. It's a shared savings uh, or excess cost models. And um, basically, you can share the savings if you are below what they call a commendable level of performance uh, and meet the quality target. So here you've got both the cost and the quality meeting together uh, before you can share the savings. And you have to pay back money um, if your costs are above an acceptable leg, le level. And there's no change if you're in between commensurate and acceptable. So let me show you a picture. So this is the actual experience um, for a, an episode. And so you have on the left the high cost folks and on the right the low cost. And you have a line at the top that says acceptable. And those that are above, above that acceptable level have to pay money back. And so interestingly, what some of the uh, uh, things that they're seeing is that they're seeing um, providers come in, try to come in just below the acceptable level. So they don't have to pay money back, but they don't have to make a lot of change either. And so this tells you you've got to set your bundles up really carefully to get the change that you want. Um, and then you have um, your gain sharing uh, model uh, line at the bottom where they get to share uh, in the um, profits. And you're commendable. And so between acceptable and commendable, you don't have to pay any money back. Um, and so they continue to file fee-for-service claims and they're reimbursed according to a fee schedule. Uh, they pay through what they call a principal accountable provider for each episode. Um, and then they uh, um, uh, do a reconciliation at the end of the year. And uh, it is now a mandatory model. And they uh, are trying to uh, get more data out to the providers so that they can um, do a better job in managing the care. And what they found is that 40% of the providers did experience savings, 22 were over budget, and the or remaining 38% saw no change. And there's anecdotal information that there have been improvements in quality. Okay, we're going to leave bundled payments. Any questions about that? 
Okay. Then on to um, uh, pay for population based. This concept is not necessarily easy to understand. So what it is, is it's paying providers to take care of a defined set of people. So if you're a PCP and you have um, 2,500 patients, um, you would get capitated payments in, a, in the most pure form. You would get capitated payments to take care of those 2,500 patients. To do that, you can no longer wait for the patient to come in the door when they're sick. You need to know who your subpopulations are that need help. You need to know who your diabetics are. You need to know who your asthmatics are. You need to know who's obese. You know, need to know who are homeless. Um, you need to know who have mental health issues that are affecting um, how they de develop care, or, uh, how they interact with, with uh, getting care. And you need to set up systems within your own practice and support from your health plan to address those needs proactively. And when you do that well, you earn savings that you can save, that you can, you, you can have. And this is turning the paradigm of healthcare upside down. Because right now, for the most part, uh, physicians respond to patients when they come in the door or when they get a call. This identifies the patients in advance and sets up systems, tracking systems, outreach systems, care systems that um, have the provider more uh, be in a proactive rate, uh, position to um, manage the care. The emphasis becomes on prevention. The emphasis becomes on keeping people out of the hospital in the emergency room. The emphasis becomes on making sure they get the community-based supports that they need. Okay? Um, uh, it's sort of getting into the weeds. How do you know who these people are? So if you have an HMO and somebody chooses a PCP, that's easy. If you have a different kind of product, um, like Medicaid that doesn't necessarily have a patient choose a PCP, then you have to use claims payments to find out who that person is most often using for primary care services. And then you attribute that individual to that patient and um, you know, based on their visit history. Um, you can have population-based payments for limited services, like just for primary care services, that um, IHNCCO is doing now with their uh, PCP cap. Um, and, or, or it can be for total cost of care, which was the example that I gave. Um, and you can have upside savings only or you can have sharing in downside risk. Now those that are um, really versed in this and watch what's happening say that the real change in behavior among providers doesn't really kick in until the providers start to assume risk. Now that risk can be shared, it doesn't have to be total. You can put, you know, like limits on the risk, um, but that so, so the people who have followed this say is where the real change occurs. Um, and there's a quality component tied in so that you don't have shared savings because you're denying care, but rather because you're providing higher quality care. So the pros is that this brings attention to the management of patient populations and not just individual patients and enhances the role of primary care because they are in uh, um, the role of really driving the bus, and with these kind of payments, they get flexibility to provide the care that's needed. The bad news is that you need a large enough population to make this work so that um, you can smooth out the risk and not put providers at risk inappropriately for random variation. Um, and this can be threatening to hospitals. Because think about it, if you keep people out of the hospital to get shared savings, you're also reducing the income of the hospital. 
Um, similarly with specialty providers, if the primary care doc's doing most of the um, um, diabetic care or um, some of the, the, the cardiac care, you may be taking services away from the specialty providers. So um, as I said, um, IHNCCO is doing a pilot with uh, PCP CAP, and it pays um, PCPs a tiered per member per month dollar amount based on risk groupings, based on history, um, and uh, history, diagnostic history and historical costs. And um, there is a special treatment for the expansion members depending on whether there's availability of utilization, cost, and data. The, um, prime, the PMPM covers primary services, so it does not include any institutional services or any professional services that typically fall outside of the PCP scope of service, okay? And this is important because PCP services are pretty stable. And so um, doing a PCP cap makes a lot of sense uh, to give the, the providers some flexibility uh, to, to do uh, service delivery in a different way. Um, it currently provides only upside risk, but there is an intent to share downside risk and to provide a, a pay for performance um, bonus. And it's looking at an option of shifting some other costs such as peer support specialists and traditional healthcare worker costs into the PCP cap. Um, you can combine all these APMs together. So you can have um, population-based contracting um, cover all or most of the services. You can add different kinds of uh, uh, alternative payment models uh, to, to, promote, to promote population management. And this is uh, particularly effective when uh, the contracting entity is not large enough to assume large amounts of risks. And they can be tailored differently uh, depending on what incentives you want. And so let me just provide one example in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts has a PCP cap. Um, and it includes the PCP costs, it's risk adjusted, it, it, it has a boosted payment, it incorporates practice transformation dollars, so the practices has money to do those new kinds of things that they need to do. And it includes an option to assume uh, behavioral health responsibility uh, services at three different levels, and depending on which level you choose, you can get additional services. So there's one example of um, behavioral health being brought in. So you've got your PCP, your enhanced PCP payment. It has your quality incentive payment, and it's based on achieving predetermined primary care quality measures, and it then has the shared savings uh, for um, the non-PCP spending. So um, I want to move along because we're, we, um, I want to get to the um, different kinds of services uh, that, uh, should, that might make sense for um, IHN CCO. So let me say, when you're thinking about PCMs, you've got to encourage delivery system reform the payment models have to allow service flexibility. So we should go back to the question of no um, rigid kinds of uh, uh, dictates. Um, they've got to include mechanisms to control utilization and spending, though, um, through your incentive systems. They have to have mechanisms for assure assuring adequate quality and outcomes so you don't get into the risk of skimping on services. Um, and that it has to have mechanisms for assuring payment. So it's got to be fair both to the plan and to the practice and to assure the kinds of quality care that you want. There's no right or wrong answer. You've got to experiment. You need to have a capacity to respond to new payment models to succeed. So you've got to have a certain mindset among your providers um, that are willing uh, to try different models and um, do something because payment reform without the delivery system provides nothing. Um, the, um, the 
the payment to the providers on the front line also has to be aligned. So if you have an ACO or um, a, a large group that gets dollars that's in a, in a um, incentive manner, how they then pay, let's say, their employed physicians has to also align. You can't just keep paying those providers on a fee-for-service basis. So it's the payment under the payment has to um, be aligned. And then you've got to get a majority of your uh, patients covered by these incentive systems so you get momentum. Um, and then we talked, about, or Kim talked about patient uh, engagement. That's critical. And then finally, you've got to have data. Um, it's got to be as close to real time as possible. And it has to be linked to care pathways and evidence-based care so that the providers know what to do when they get the data. It's just not data for data's sake. It's data to make a change. Um, and so as we, I've been saying, model design and model implementation are equally important. Um, and then look at payment measures that um, are really tied to your priorities because you get what you pay for. OK. Um, what could IHN consider? Uh, so um, we talked about it's got to fit into the local environment. And I note that you've got P two, three PCB practices with 3,000 or more members. And that's important because less than that, um, you've got to start really tailoring the risk that um, is taken on. Um, you've got 33 PCPs that have between 250 and 3,000 members. 28% um, of the members are cared for by um, Samaritan-employed PCPs. And then 70% uh, of the inpatient admissions go to Samaritan hospitals. All these factors feed into what's feasible with, uh, for Samaritan. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose separate ideas for those that are contracted, not employed Samaritan providers, and those that are Samaritan-employed uh, providers, OK? Um, so for PCPs, build off what you've already started. You've got a, a healthy a patient-centered medical program. Um, you need to provide uh, PCPs with flexibility to offer these value-added services. So propose two capitation models, um, some of which uh, IHN CCO is already starting. So with those with 3,000 plus members, do your PCP cap built on historical costs with an added amount for uh, funding care management and infrastructure development. Um, and then provide shared savings opportunities for the non-PCP services. And uh, build incentives around reducing ED visits, inpatient stays, ancillary service use of specialists. Um, and then include quality requirements either as a condition of getting your shared savings or as a separate uh, implementation uh, quality bonus. And then tie your quality bonuses uh, and measurements to what the IHN CCO's performance measurements are. So the better the providers do, the better the plan's going to do, the more money they're going to get for achieving their quality bonuses, and the more they can then feed down into um, the payers. Uh, one idea is to uh, increase the uh, impact of the shared so opportunities is to limit the PCP caps over time and increase the percentage of shared saving opportunities. So with those between 250 and 3,000 members, do your PCP cap with historical costs and then add on a pay for performance payment model. Um, select the quality measures that are again tied to what's the um, CCO needs to achieve, and consider um, some, some variations. Consider offering increased capitation to practice achieving the PCP CH level three, because you know they're really starting to uh, achieve payment uh, uh, performance uh, improvement and um, delivery system transformation. Because these are uh, sh small practices, they on their own really, we believe, are too small to assume uh, risk. But you could pull them together and do some kind of shared uh, savings program. To do 
practice transformation, care management is a critical component of it. So there may be opportunities to do uh, community-based care teams to provide care management services for these smaller practices um, so that they can um, look uh, like they can uh, have a reasonable opportunity to do some shared savings. Um, and again, you could consider limiting the PCP cap increase and increasing the pay for performance opportunity. This model, the, um, I understand you have uh, very sizable mental health practice, practices that are currently capitated for their services. You could offer a shared opportunity, uh, opportunity for them um, and if the cap doesn't already cover physical health accountability, you could add that as well. Specialists, um, again, the incentive is to uh, uh, provide incentives to increase efficiencies and reduce complications. Um, bundled payments are the most logical thing to do with specialists. Um, being a Medicaid program, maternity plus baby, but exclude level four, NICU is an opportunity, and some orthopedic surgery or joint replacements might be an opportunity also to get enough volume um, uh, and uh, historical variation to make it worthwhile. One other opportunity is to just uh, work with the specialist to say, we're gonna give you a shared savings opportunity. And that calculating uh, of the savings could be based either on a budget uh, based on historical costs or the gap between expected and actual PMPM costs. So it's basically a virtual um, budget for specialists that aren't on a budget. And it's upside only, and it would be a voluntary thing that they uh, you know, could, could participate in. Um, and you could certainly uh, manage risk by including corridors and excluding outliers. So to make it, you know, fair for both the plan and for the specialist. And then a uh, hospitalist uh, bundled payments also may be an opportunity for uh, marrying the hospital physician and the downstream provider incentives. And then maternity plus baby, the orthopedic joint uh, replacements, and then cardiac surgery are opportunities. And then I note that Maryland and Vermont are considering global hospital budgets. And that means that they, that they, the hospitals, are paid a certain amount to cover all patients regardless of where they uh, reside or what their plan coverage is. And then the states are going to be limiting the budget increases um, to specific annual increases. So that's a really uh, uh, a uh, out on the, the forefront method of uh, paying for population management. Okay, um, since uh, the CCO deals with the Medicaid population, there are, um, you know, the group of individuals who are generally 5% of the population who generate 50% of the costs, uh, oftentimes called quadrant four. Um, enrollees, they have both high uh, or uh, complicated physical as well as behavioral health conditions. And um, a model that's be, being used, uh, and I understand it's actually being used right here in Lebanon, is your intensive ambulatory care uh, team. And you could capitate that team uh, and provide for them to provide the primary care and outpatient behavioral health services with all the um, support services, services necessary. Uh, or you could do a total cost of care depending on how many people are in there, and, and then include payment from uh, mechanisms to manage the risk. Uh, that could be done uh, either through pairing with a high functioning PCP with a high volume mental health provider, or it could be even created within the Samaritan system. And I understand one of the problems that you're dealing with in expanding this model beyond the Le Lebanon area is that some of the higher cost folks are out on the coast and it's very dispersed. And so you'll have to you know, think a different model of getting those services out to them. So then let's finally um, move to the Samaritan employed physicians and hospitals. Um, the goal would be to create a population-based incentive model 
that encourages physicians and hospitals to care for the population and not just for individuals that are coming in the door or through the doors for care. And it really requires a change in viewpoint. Um, so for instance, hospital beds that are currently viewed as a revenue source for hospitals would have to be start to be viewed as a cost uh, entity uh, or a cost, a cost center. Patients are treated episodically when they come through the door. They would have to be viewed as uh, 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 a, a person and a group of people that would have to have uh, prevention and management to reduce the health risks. And physicians wouldn't be just gen uh, revenue generators. They would be partners in delivering redesign and patient management. Now, I've interviewed a um, hospital system and an IPA that's um, in a system in a state that has a heavy use of risk-bearing contracts. Excuse me, and they said that they, the hospital said that their um, attitudes and views started to change after about 10% of their total revenue was at risk, either through pay for performance, risk-based contracts with either just upside only or upside and downside risk, that they started to then look at population management, started to view the IPA as a partner in developing programs to manage patients and to develop data and to really ch uh, change how they um, started thinking about uh, patient uh, management. So the opportunities would be uh, uh, capitation based on total cost of care. Um, it would have to involve a risk adjusted PMPM rates. You would need to do things such as outlier exclusions to negate the insurance risk. Because there is, um, there are events that occur that are random and cannot be controlled by physicians or any other kind of provider. That is appropriately, that risk is appropriately assumed by the insurer and it should not be assumed by the providers and there are mechanisms to control that. Um, so you've got a capitation on total cost of care. Uh, it, it, you have um, uh, a shared savings, so you have upside shared savings opportunities. You need uh, care corridors on both upside um, in terms of how much is shared, but also when that sharing should start because the payer has to feel it's fair to them also that um, they are paying for true change and true savings and not for random variation. Quality performance are need to be linked in there um, and then uh, tied with your uh, shared savings. Once um, the hospital system is comfortable, you can move to a capitation with a downside risk. So you still have your capitation based on total cost of care, but then you have your risk assumption, uh, which can be either limited downside risk at first or then full assumption of risk uh, with your control for your negative insurance risk and include, include quality performance requirements. Downside risk assumption is not easy. You have to be ready for it. So you need to have your IT reporting and infrastructure. You need your care management capabilities. You need people in place to um, know when to outreach to patients and how to outreach to them and have programs set in place to provide the services they need so they don't land back into the hospital or the ED. Um, you need population management capabilities. You need ways to um, stratify your patient population and know which ones are going to be that most at risk uh, populations. Um, you need um, uh, a, a very solid primary care base. So um, those PCPs need to be functioning as patient-centered medical homes that they themselves are proactively outreaching to their um, higher cost or um, patients that are likely to get in trouble in the future. There needs to be a range of physical and behavioral health services offered within the ACO to make it work, or do you need a really close partner for behavioral health services? Um, you need reserves and reinsurance. You need strong clinical leadership that understand what it, what it means to assume risk and to change um, how the outlook uh, the outlook on patient and care. And um, 
there needs to be administration of provider payment systems. So how the employed physicians are paid, that aligns the physicians and the ACO goals. So if you have a hospital that plays its employed physicians solely on a fee-for-service uh, basis, that payment system needs to change to include incentives for reaching performance goals around qualities, um, for implementing uh, uh, programs that the, the system wants to implement to uh, you know, share cost, that type of thing. So um, that's a lot of information. Uh, any comments? Any uh, questions? And I, and I have much, as much time as people would like, so. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and I agree and support everything you, that you said about alternate payment methodologies, payment reform. And I liked uh, that you included the cautionary notes. And I um, jotted down a few other cautionary notes just because we have an active um, audience in front of us too that as we're looking for true change in the healthcare system, we should be aware of these other cautionary notes. And that was the need to really look at health literacy, behavior change, shared decision making. We need to look at the systems of care versus the tendency to sometimes vilify physicians for the fee-for-service model. And I bring that up because the public may not be aware that physicians are not the principal beneficiaries of healthcare spending. In fact, the great majority go to hospitals and device manufacturers. And in California, when Medicare looked at the payment for a hip surgery, it was $18,000 of a bill. And $16,000 in cha and change went to the hospital, and $1,400 went to the surgeon that actually did the surgical technique. So I just feel we as the public need to be aware of that, that we sometimes can have a tendency to vilify physicians um, in the need for change. And then the importance of data. We're three months today away from ICD-10 implementation. And I'm an advocate for ICD-10 because we can't wait for ICD-11. That, will, that won't come until 2020, um, if we're lucky. But um, many of the public don't know that the cost to implement ICD-10 in a primary care practice, if I was a solo physician, it would cost me about $85,000. And the public might also be alarmed that that's actually the take-home pay for many in primary care if you were running your own solo practice. And then um, the last one is one of my favorites, but the tendency of consumerism of healthcare in America and the wanting versus needing something. And I bring up my favorite, and that's uh, MRI for low back pain without any red flags. We as consumers in healthcare have to be okay with looking at the data and not wanting something just because they want it. We have to do that shared decision making with patients so that they understand they may not need something yet. And so that, those are just my cautionary uh, notes that I wanted to bring up. Thank you. I, I think those are excellent. And um, I think that you expanded that one line I had about patient engagement, so thank you very much. Agree with Um, one thing is the logic of rewarding physicians with good behavior. Um, we want people to go into this to this uh, without having financially for doing the right thing. So that's uh, one issue I have about rewarding people, doctors, with money for doing the right thing. Uh, another question is, how relevant are the metrics we are now using? Um, two comments. Uh, let's see. Um, rewarding physicians for doing the right thing. Um, the fee-for-service system rewards physicians for doing both the right thing and the wrong thing. And so I think that what the payment reform is doing is recognizing that um, that there is a change in the way we th need to think about reimbursement to bring out the, the best. Now, there's a very interesting book called Drive, and it outlines three motivators. I highly recommend it. It's a Daniel, I think it's Daniel Pink book. 
and it indicates that mission is one of the strongest drive drivers, expertise is another one, and then um, I, I think uh, some kind of, a, of uh, money or something like that. And that there are physicians that are highly insulted by um, pay for performance programs because they are already doing the right thing. And so you have to know who your population is in terms of your physicians and structure payment systems that work for them. That physician may work best in a salaried um, model that, you know, that, that has global payment uh, uh, systems or global reimbursement pay for performance systems for the whole system and not just for that individual's physician. Whereas other physicians um, are mastery oriented and darn it, they love hitting their mark on their uh, pay for performance goals. So it just, it, you know, they're different um, motivators and you're right, you gotta be aware of them all. Now, are we using the right metrics? There is a group called the National Quality Forum. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Um, but they are, um, at, just as they said, a national group that works at, looks at quality metrics 24-7. And they are, I think, probably more than any other group doing their best to get the experts together to figure out how to measure quality in a meaningful way. And um, so a lot of these programs use measures out of the quality forum. Um, I will tell you that there are also a need when you do uh, uh, pay for performance uh, and other kind of system changes to look at measures that are tied to your specific model and make sure that the, that the incentives work within your model and are rewarding uh, the, the providers for implementing the model you want them to implement. So you may have to develop your own. But to the extent that you can use national me measures that are recognized, that are validated, that allow you to then compare yourself to a broader group, the better off. And, and Kim, jump in here if you have things to add. Oh, Right. So if I could have Dotha give the microphone back to Dr. Yuvan Chin, and he can talk about what the Oregon Health Leadership Council is doing to work to align metrics across payers. So a group called the Oregon Health Leadership uh, Council a few years ago to basically look at that. It was the major commercial payers getting together with the major health systems in the state of Oregon along with employer groups. And they wanted to address the rising costs that employers were having to have coverage for their um, employees. So there is a group called the Evidence-Based Best Practices Committee that's actually looking at exactly that. Rather than every major payer in the state developing their own metrics, they're really wanting to adopt aligned metrics. And they are looking and, and, and collaborating with the Oregon Health Authority with the CCO incentive metrics to see if they as well, we, Oregon Health Leadership Council, could try to be aligned as much as possible with those um, initial measurements. So it is early work that is occurring, um, but I'm happy to say that it is actually occurring. I'll also add that this is a um, movement that's starting to be looked at nationally. Uh, because there is more and more recognition, number one, that patients can, uh, that, excuse me, that providers can only focus on a certain number to be reasonable. Um, and second of all, that the, the measures are all over the place. Uh, I think I heard uh, said that you worked in Michigan for a while. Uh, after. Additionally, to going to school there? I did go to school there. <laughs> but, well, the reason I'm asking is that I understand that Blue Cross Blue Shield there uh, has done some uh, really good work in terms of uh, the sort of thing we're talking about. Do you, anything, do you have any comments on that program? 
Um, I am only vaguely aware of it. I am aware, aware of it's a very good program. One thing that I know that they've done is that they have um, done some very targeted programs to um, improve um, certain uh, areas of activity like diabetic, diabetic care and really poured a lot of resources in not just money but um, technical assistance. So it was this combination of identifying best practices, um, uh, paying uh, in a new way, and providing technical assistance. So, but yes, they, they are one of the um, leaders in, in a lot of payment reform activities. Um, it sounds like one of the things you've observed is that no matter what you do, you have to count on people trying to game the system. As soon as they figure out what the incentives are, they'll go after the incentives and not the big picture that you're trying to foster. Um, let me say, some people will do that. I don't think everybody does that. But I think that the reality is you get what you pay for. And so the message is not that people gain the system, but that you have to very carefully structure your uh, payment program so it will lead to the results that you're looking for. And yes, you have to walk through the different opportunities of, of what might happen and figure out how to respond to that. Do we have any other questions? Do we have one more? And just uh, a question of whether you have some way of showing real life uh, programs that are doing exactly what you're thinking might be the best model. For example, the Grand Junction, Colorado, um, the way they do things, does that, is that a model that can be generalized to other centers or the way group health does things? Um, do you have um, examples you would recommend for us to go study? I'm thinking of a program that T.R. Reid uh, presented on um, Frontline called uh, U.S. Healthcare, The Good News. And I he, did not see that. Okay. Um, I, I, w what I tried to do was give you some models that work. Um, and if uh, Kim would like some more examples of, um, of the models that, that have, are uh, areas that have implemented those models, I can certainly do that. Mm -hmm.